and welcome back. And our way to understand what caches are, sometimes it helps to have a really good analogy. This library analogy is really, very really strong. So let's take a look at what that means and understand how that connects to what caches are. Here's the big picture. You've seen this before. This is the high-level abstraction layer of why this is the new school machine structures class, not just the old school machine structures class. And today we're looking at those two pieces, caches and main memory and how they interact. Here is the picture of the components of the computer. Just to re remind you on the left is the processor, control and data path, control is the brain, data path is the brawn, the wires. You have some interaction with memory and memory has interaction with I, I and O. But the idea is how would this change if I bring in what caches are? So keep this in mind as I start to teach you what caches are in the next slide or two. So here's the analogy with libraries, and let's think of make sure that we're familiar with how this works. So you've got to find a book in a big library. You know, you're a Cal student. You're trying to find a book in the stacks. So what is your process? Well, you've got to go and go find the catalog, card, card, card catalog, and it's really large, and so you're searching, 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 and the larger the library, the slower that is, because there's more things to search through. There's also the round trip time to actually walk to the stacks, pick up the book, and actually retrieve the desired book. So there's kind of two stages. One is to look at where it is, and then the second is to figure out, actually go get it and bring it back. So there's the getting it, bringing it back, and then finding out where it is. The larger you make libraries, the worse, the worse that is. Imagine the card catalog is, you know, floors of card catalogs. Imagine how painful that might be back in the days before search. Yeah, by the way, before you know, having computers and libraries, this is the model, just so you appreciate how painful it used to be. Back, okay, boomer, yeah, right, you get it? All right, here we go. So electronic uh, memories, i.e. Virtu you know, virtual libraries in that sense, uh, have the same issue. And plus the technology, as you go to different technologies to store the bits, as you go farther away from the CPU, the fastest one is the registers, literally the fastest one is the registers, and you go farther away from that, they get larger and they get much slower. And so the, the full technology changes there, and that's different than libraries. Libraries are like a, a longer distance, another floor. This is like, what if another floor required you to walk through quicksand or something? That's, it's a, so it's even worse when you get to um, computer memories in terms of well, a large library, well, I'll just have to walk longer. You know, New York Public Library may be one of the largest ones in the world, whatever. It's just walking farther. Here, it's actually walking farther and the time is slower per step. It's even worse. All right, what we want, in the ideal case, by the way, we want a really large memory, one as large as we can, but as fast as the smallest element. That's the perfect thing. Boy, I want it fast as registers, but as big as, as, as infinity. So that's really what we're looking for. This is more back setup again. Back in the 80s, um, the diff, 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 these are two graphs of the graphs between the speed of a processor and the speed of memory. Uh, how, how many clock cycles were to, to, do, to do something. And so what you're seeing is that CPU performance has increased incredibly. Um, but in terms of the time, to get to memory, it, memory has increased much slower than that. And that's that increase of 7% per year versus 55% per year. This graph ends in 2010, but it, and it flattened out. You know, CPU performance flattened out um, after about 2004, 2005. We call this the C change. We'll actually talk about that in this class. Um, but still, that gap was really big. And they, so the gap is closing, but it's not closing very fast. So that's an issue. So if you think about it, 1980, um, Basically, one instruction is the same as DRAM access. So if I happen to need to go to memory, that's not a big deal. But in 2020, to go to memory is a thousand instructions. So the CPU, if I do nothing else, if I'm not smart about how I use my time, the CPU is sitting idle for a thousand cycles, a thousand full cycles, which might not seem a big deal to you because it's at a gigahertz level, so it's like, what's the big deal? But in terms of, what if I'm doing this a lot? What if I'm doing this a lot? That ends up being a bit, have a big performance hit on, on, our, on our software, especially as I'm trying to compute on larger and larger uh, quantities of data. I can't afford to have that that hit, that memory hit to do that. So we're doing all, all, this whole set of lectures is to deal with this slide here. How we try to deal with that disparity between CPU speed and DRAM speed. That's it. So in the next couple of lectures, and this is the last slide on this particular I issue, we're gonna see whether an idea called caches can resolve and solve this problem, okay? The idea is in the big picture, can I be as fast as I can, as fast as a register, but at the speed, sorry, as fast as a register, but at the size of un unimaginable size, unimaginable size of my hard drive, even bigger than that. Could I work with that? Okay, we'll see you at the next lecture.